Live from WTVO Rockford and your home team, Eyewitness News at 5 starts now. A woman is dead after a crash involving a fire truck. Investigators look into what caused the collision. Beloit City Council approves plans for a new entertainment venue. The project transforms a former manufacturing facility. And we now know the Sweet 16 in the annual Makers Madness Tournament. We take a look at some of the state line products in the contest. Good evening, I'm Mimi Murphy. And I'm Eric Wilson. A woman is dead after a crash involving a Rockford fire truck. We first told you about this yesterday. The accident happened at North Church and Whitman Streets around 1115 in the morning. Investigators say 56-year-old Marta Esquivias of Rockford was driving when the vehicle she was in collided with a fire truck. Esquivias was taken to a local hospital where she was pronounced dead. A passenger in the car, a 60-year-old man, was also taken to the hospital. His condition is unknown. Rockford police are investigating the crash. We now know the name of the man killed in a fiery Rock County crash over the weekend. He's 19-year-old Jorge Susanaga of Woodstock. The crash happened Sunday morning on East State Highway 67 near Northrop Road in the town of Clinton. Investigators say Susanaga was driving east on 67 when he crossed over the center line. He hit another car head on. His vehicle caught on fire. Susanaga died at the scene. The driver of the other vehicle was taken to Javon Bay Hospital with serious injuries. At last check, they were in stable condition. People living in Garden Prairie remember the five family members killed in a house fire a year ago. The youngest victim was nine-year-old Aniela Tatman, 13-year-old Zofia Tatman, 14-year-old Danica Tatman, 20-year-old Elizabeth McConaughey, and 24-year-old Emmanuel McConaughey also died. Medical examiners say the five all died from breathing smoke. Six other victims went to the hospital. The local fire chief said the fire was, quote, a tragedy he had never seen in his 40 years as a firefighter. Relatives are still running a GoFundMe for the survivors. We have a link in this story at mystateline.com. Here in Rockford, recruiters will spend the next month searching for the best of the best to join the city's fire department. Our Nikhil Delgado gives us a behind the scenes look at what it takes to become a firefighter. Nikhil? Eric, Mimi, you can make up to $90,000 if you stay on the Rockford Fire Department. However, for those on the front lines, it's not about the pay, it's about saving lives. Recruitment is now open for the first time in two years, and there's a lot in the process. Take a look. You gotta think I was a teacher before becoming a fire. Bo Cheney never expected he'd turn in his classroom for a firehouse. 18 years after a group of friends motivated him to test for Rockford's fire department. He's now encouraging others to do the same. I'm living proof and it's other people that have dual jobs that live proof that you can take other professionals and, and turn them into firefighters. Cassidy Mack remembers going through the testing process when she first started over a year ago. It's a little bit different than just filling out an application for a normal job um, and then just put your mind to it if it's something you really want to do. Candidates will take a written and physical ability test before a sit-down interview. And you'll go along the wall. Okay, crawl along the wall. That includes an attempted search and rescue, like this. I myself had a hard time seeing through the helmet and smoke. Keep going. We got a room here. I get that room. Keep going. See what you see. I got a room. Nobody in the room. We good. Okay. I see Teddy. See Teddy. I see Teddy. All right. Let's grab Teddy. Let's go, Teddy. All right. Still got Teddy. Still got Teddy. All right. The gear alone weighs 75 pounds. Basically, look for somebody that's athletic, uh, somebody that wants to be part of a team because it's a lot of teamwork involved in it and somebody willing to learn. Cheney says while the search is on for new recruits, the department has become so much more than his workplace, calling it his second home. And the biggest thing about it is that you join a family from the time that you step into the fire department until the time you retire, even after you retire. The application process is longer than a regular job. It starts in February and ends in November. Candidates have a 30 days to apply. Eric? Nikal, thanks. The Rockford Police Department adds more license plate readers to city streets. That's thanks to a deal with an Atlanta-based company. The trial period included 64 cameras. According to the department, during the trial, there were gaps in coverage. So RPD brass are requesting 36 cameras be added to the system. The contract's almost $285,000 the first year and then $251,000 every year after that. 
Money comes from the police department's operating budget. Beloit City Council approves a plan for the Ironworks campus that will transform the area into an entertainment venue. 17,000 square feet will now be used to make room for duck pin bowling, an arcade, indoor yard games, and two bars. There will also be a live band performance space. The Ironworks sits along the Rock River. It served as a heavy manufacturing facility for more than 150 years. The campus was purchased by developers in 2001. It's now home to more than 20 businesses. More people living in Illinois applied for student loan debt relief than in any other state. According to the Chicago Sun-Times, data from the U.S. Department of Education show more than 70% of eligible borrowers in Cook County applied for or qualified for debt relief. That's about a million and a half people, but they'll have to wait a few more months to learn if they'll be able to have some of their loans forgiven. The Supreme Court could decide whether President Biden's loan forgiveness program is constitutional. Justices are expected to rule this summer. Rivian plans to take on more debt. The electric automaker will sell $1.3 billion in bonds because of weakening demand and higher production costs. Rivian has a cash balance of $11.5 billion. Last quarter, that was $13.2 billion. The company's been losing money on every vehicle it builds. It laid off 6% of its workforce last month. Rivian executives say they have enough cash on hand to pay for operations through 2025. You might remember Rivian as the winner of the 2022 Maker's Madness contest in Illinois. This year's competition is down to the Sweet 16. That includes some products made right here in the state line. Rockford based Obsidian Manufacturing Industries Magna Vice is one of the finalists. It will go up against telescopes created by McChesney Park's Astrophysics. And Ingersoll Machine Tools Rosenberg Moon Habitat will take on Effingham's Joint Active System and its JAS Knee. The competition's put on by the Illinois Manufacturers Association. The bracket style tournament is used to find the coolest thing made in Illinois. This round of voting runs through March 12th. You can find a link to vote at mystateline.com. The White House responds to the killing of two Americans in Mexico. The victims were among four U.S. citizens abducted last Friday. They were caught in the crossfire of rival drug cartel groups. It happened shortly after the four entered the border town of Matamoros, Mexico from Texas. One of the two survivors was hurt. Those survivors are back on U.S. soil. White House spokesperson Karine Jean-Pierre says the U.S. is working with the Mexican government to return the two Americans who were killed. Attacks on U.S. citizens are unacceptable, no matter where or under what circumstance, circumstances they happen. We will continue to work closely with the Mexican government to ensure justice is done in this case. Mexican investigators say they have one person in custody and are looking for others. One victim's relative says the group went to Mexico from South Carolina, so one of them could have a medical procedure. U.S. Senators take a detailed look at gaps in military health care as President Biden prepares to release his proposed budget later this week. The Pentagon's top health officials revealed where their efforts stand to combat what many call the biggest issue facing service members, mental health. Washington correspondent Jesse Tanua reports. The access to mental health was just completely inadequate. Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy said the Navy failed the crew of the aircraft carrier USS George Washington. Between April 2021 and 2022, at least seven of its soldiers died, with multiple deaths ruled as suicides. There is still a final investigation that is uh, outstanding, but what can you tell me today about how we're changing conditions? The Surgeon General of the Navy, Rear Admiral Bruce Gillingham, said all recruits now learn stress reduction techniques and meditation, and leaders have a new mental health playbook with ways to prevent suicide. From the Secretary of Navy on down, uh, we have taken this issue very seriously. But Murphy and other senators brought up a larger cultural issue within every branch of the military that they say these tragedies put in the spotlight. Reported that they were often hesitant to seek mental health treatment through Navy channels because they were under the impression that it would affect their future career opportunities. The Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, Dr. Lester Martinez Lopez, said culture takes a while to change. We are really making headways, but we're not done yet. Martinez Lopez said the Pentagon is taking a public health approach to mental health to make asking for help easier for service members and ultimately save lives. Mental health is health. It's like anything else we need. In Washington, I'm Jesse Tenor.
Now, your first warm weather forecast from Chief Meteorologist Candace King. Well, we continue with Illinois Severe Weather Preparedness Week. So let's talk a little bit about wind and wind damage because you can get a strong enough wind to do just as much damage at what an, as what an EF0, EF1, or even EF2 tornado could do. So wind speeds 40 to 55 miles per hour. You've got twigs, small branches that begin to break. Lightweight objects outside those begin to blow around. You really start to see that damage increase once you get up over 60 miles per hour. Large limbs begin to break, shallow trees, those are pushed over, and then you start to see damage to shingles there on the roofs. 80 plus miles per hour, that's an excessive uh, wind damage, visible structural damage, trees uprooted, barns destroyed. You start to see a lot of more widespread damage, and winds in excess of 80 miles per hour, as I mentioned, can cause as much damage as a tornado. So just some things, again, to keep in mind as we continue with our severe weather preparedness week and tying that into we've got a couple of storm spotter training classes coming up here in the weeks to come Dixon down in Lee County that's Thursday March 16th so next week out at Sauk Valley Community College 630 to 830 following week March 20th Monday 630 to 830 out in Freeport at Highland Community College so if you're thinking about maybe becoming a trained spotter with the National Weather Service you learn all about storm structure what to spot how to spot how to be safe with that. It's a two hour course open and free to the public, really geared for anyone 10 years of age and older, a good class to go to. So I encourage a lot of you to, if you can attend, to attend one of those, you get a little bit more information and kind of more knowledge too about storms, severe thunderstorms and storm structure. Now it's not severe weather we've got going on this week, but rather a taste of winter weather potentially later this week. A winter storm watch has already been issued for Stevenson, Joe Davies, and Carroll counties. This goes into effect Thursday afternoon and will run through Friday morning. This out ahead of our next storm system already beginning to take shape here out to the west. Doesn't look like much, and it's not really going to be much, at least for the next 24 to 36 hours, but it does work in our direction as we look towards Thursday afternoon. So things are going to stay pretty quiet here as we go through the night. We've got cloud cover that'll stay with us. Back into the 40s tomorrow, despite that cloud cover we have for tomorrow afternoon, a lot of dry air to go overcome initially with high pressure to the north of us, but once we get into Thursday night, looks like we could start to see some lighter snow showers begin to work in. Kind of the track of this still one to watch as that area of low pressure works to the south of us. I think we are going to see a good opportunity for some snow showers. That freezing line comes very close, so if that works a little bit further up to the north, we could end up with a little more of a rain snow mix, but either way, an impactful system coming up Thursday night and then into Friday with that possibility for some accumulating snowfall with that. So something to keep in mind here as we look towards the end of the week, temperatures are still key with the storm system and then you've got those impacts too. Winds are also going to be increasing with that as our temperatures drop down through the 30s. So we're still in the 40s for tomorrow, 45 degrees, a little breezy for the afternoon, 41 on Thursday. We'll see those numbers drop guys by the end of the week and we'll stay in the 30s as we look into the weekend. Now sports with sports director Scott Lever. More and more, it feels like Aaron Rodgers has played his last game as a Green Bay Packer. Either he'll retire or he'll be playing somewhere else next season. ESPN and others are reporting that personnel from the New York Jets have flown to California to meet in person with Rodgers. They would need permission from the Packers to do that, so that indicates again that the Packers are probably ready to move on from Rodgers. The Jets are desperate for a veteran championship-level quarterback who can help them win immediately. They're expected to do all they can to convince Rodgers that New York is the place for him. And once that's done, then they'll do whatever it takes to make a trade for him with the Packers. Now the Ravens have put their franchise tag on their quarterback, Lamar Jackson. The two sides still haven't been able to agree on a long-term contract. Johnson was the NFL's MVP in 2019. For the last two years, he's been plagued by injuries. His touchdown pass to interception ratio hasn't been the greatest. It's 33-20. to 20. This is a sad day for folks connected with the Belvedere High School. Former Belvedere football coach and administrator Doug Chapman has died. Chapman was the Bucks head football coach for five seasons from 1970 to 74. His 72 team had a record of 8-1. and one. His 74 team went 8-2 and two and made the playoffs. Chapman was also Belvedere's athletic director from 1977 through 1992. The Ice Hogs are entering the stretch run of their season, but in some ways it feels like training camp all over again. That's because they have welcomed so many newcomers to the team. 
Today, they were all getting to better acquainted during practice at the Riverview Ice House. The Ice Hogs and the Blackhawks made a flurry of trades last week and saw players like Dylan Secura, Adam Clendenning, and Josiah Slavin get sent out. And veterans Rocco Grimaldi and Anton Kudobin were brought in along with several younger players. There's a lot of new faces, but uh, you know all the new guys that have came in. They've they've been great guys, and uh, you know they look like really good players on the ice, and they're great guys off the ice. So it's uh, it's been awesome to, to meet all these um, guys and to come in. And uh, but yeah, it does feel like it's a it's a new year a little bit. Yeah. I thought today was a great first day. I thought the guys were having fun on the ice. Everybody seems to be chatting along, and we had a good meeting before practice, and I think everything was great. So we'll see. Oh, more on the new look Ice Hogs roster with general manager Mark Bernard tonight at 9 and 10. Three players on the NIU women's basketball team have earned all MAC honors for this season. Senior forward Aja Davis has made the MAC first team. She leads NIU in scoring at 16 points per game. And she's third in the nation in rebounding at 12 and a half a game. Senior guard Shelby Coker makes the all MAC second team. She averaged almost 16 points per game, and she's second in the conference in three point percentage. And senior guard Jane Poisson is the MAC's sixth player of the year off the bench. She averages almost 11 points per game. NIU is going to play in the MAC tournament quarterfinals tomorrow against Kent State. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.